Hello and welcome to Navani Milor and Fury video. I'm Shangok, your host, and today we are going to take a closer look at why Demiurge will attack the Holy Kingdom, since there are a couple of reasons behind this invasion. But before we are going to take a closer look at any of this, let me quickly thank my Patreons for supporting this channel, as well as say thanks to all users of the YouTube Thanks function for making one-time donations. And with that said, let's get to the topic at hand. In all of the trailers for the new Overlord movie about the Sacred Kingdom, Demiurge has unleashed a massive attack on it, with a gigantic army composed of the Demihumans and heteromorphic tribes and proto-states from the Abelian Hills, reinforced by his own summoned demonic legions. And he quickly will occupy the northern part of the country, and bring it completely under his control. And this raises a question. Why? Why does Demiurge do such things? What are his motives? And what does he hope to achieve in the grand scheme of things? And after talking about the Demi-Human army of the Balian Hills, and about how the kingdom itself is set up to defend itself from such incursions, and why they will be overwhelmed, today we are going to discuss the why. And the first reason is quite general but also very convincing. Demiurge has misunderstood Einzel Grohn. When Einzel Grohn thought about Ulbert Elaine Odell's words, how wonderful it would be to conquer one of the worlds of Yggdrasil online. And when Eins previously referred to the world as a box full of jewels, Demiurge, who was created by Ulbert Elaine Odell, and therefore knew precisely what Ulbert meant, when he talked about world domination, and how serious he was, misunderstood Eins Ulgorn's intentions. He saw Eins as the overlord, a role Eins never wanted to take on, so of course Demiurge concluded that this was the moment Eins decided to conquer the world. And therefore Demiurge readied Nazarick, so that it could actually conquer it, so that it actually could present this box of jewels to Eins Ulgorn. And this was also communicated to all of the members of the guild, except to Eins of course, who presumably of course knew all about this because it was his own idea. And Eins only realized what he had actually said seven volumes later, by which point it was too late to change anything, at least from his own perspective, and explained that he never actually said that he wanted to conquer the world, because otherwise his NPCs, the beloved children of his friends, would have serious regrets about doing something completely wrong for so long. And I know this sounds strange and trivial, but remember, Shelty was deeply troubled by the mind control incident until volume 11, and Nabral Gamma wanted to pay with her own life when she accidentally mentioned Albedo's name, and implied that Albedo and Eins were already together. In other words, if the misunderstandings were cleared up now, it would cause a great deal of turmoil among the entire guild, something Eins desperately wanted to avoid. And this general order of world conquest is also the basis for Demiurge's actions. The next reason was the brilliant display of absolute obliviousness in the amphitheater in the imperial capital of Aventar. Demiurge was also in the process of conquering the Empire, and the first step in his brilliant plan was to shadowly direct Emperor Jerknuf to form a grand coalition by presenting the might of Nazarick to the Emperor when he arrived, to make the necessity for such an anti nazarick alliance clear to the entire world. Jerknuf then asked Ein Solgon to use his strongest spell on the Battle of the Cards plane. However, he had no idea how powerful his non-strongest but still the most spectacular spell would be, and that his own troops would also flee the battlefield in utter panic. But that was just one piece of a complex plan Demiurge had been working on for months, and that would take many more months to come into fruition. So he was even more astonished when Albedo received a formal request for vassalization from the Empire, after a brief visit from Ein Solgon, which she then presented to Demiurge. 
noting that Ein Zulgon was already on his way to the Dwarven Kingdom. Demiurge was now completely impressed and convinced of Ein Zulgon's brilliancy, and he intensified his efforts in the Holy Kingdom, where somewhere nearby the legendary Happy Farm also must be located. And within the scope of his capabilities, he wanted to initiate an equally brilliant and ingenious takeover of the Holy Kingdom, with all manners of complex implication and layers. Which leads us to the question, why specifically the Holy Kingdom and why Demiurge? And the explanation is very straightforward. It was part of his original responsibility from the beginning. Because originally, Demiurge was in charge of the Empire and the Holy Kingdom, while the Dwarven Kingdom was spontaneously self-assigned to Ein Sulgon, and Albedo was responsible for the Kingdom of Riestais, when it came to subjugation. And since the theocracy of Slain was not an urgent war target until the revelation of the attack on Sheltier, only the Holy Kingdom remained. Furthermore, it also seems to be somewhat personal. Demiurge is thoroughly evil, someone who loves and enjoys the suffering of others, which stands in stark contrast to Albedo, who simply wants to see the worms and scum, the outsiders of Nazarek, dead, and just mercilessly deals with them, but who doesn't keep them alive to see them suffer. And what target could be better for a demon than the Holy Kingdom, with its deeply devout population, a paladin order that is neither corrupt nor bribable, and whose leaders are honest and loyal, and whose head paladin is actually adhering to the chivalric ideals of the good Queen Kalka Bizarres, who genuinely wants the best for everyone and works towards ushering in a new era of peace and prosperity. There's probably no other country in the new world of Overlord, except perhaps the theocracy of Slain, that would bring Demiurge as much joy to completely ruin and corrupt and plunge into utter misery as this one. So a personal motive certainly plays a role here. But cold and rational political consideration was also of enormous importance. Since its founding shortly after the massacre at the Cuts Plain, the young Sorcerer Kingdom was very strongly isolated. An isolation that was only somewhat lifted by Ein Sulgun's subjugation of the Baharut Empire. Now it had access to the markets, resources, labor, produce and trade routes of the empire, which extend all the way down to the Minotaur Kingdom. On the other hand, Thanks to Albedo, the Kingdom of Riestais has sent merchants, even though they were from the Eight Fingers, whom Albedo now controlled. However, these were all just forced alliances. In any case, the Sorcerer Kingdom was still perceived internationally as a pariah, and many merchants, traders, craftsmen and workers remained distant from the Kingdom. That's why the invasion of the Holy Kingdom was combined with an image campaign. Demiurge as the demon Emperor Yaldabaoth would invade the Northern Holy Kingdom, and since the Kingdom of Riestais had not yet recovered from the effects of the five delightful goats of Ein Zulgon, it couldn't send its own troops, and it also had no adventurers on Mormon's level who were willing to help. Moreover, the other major military power, the Baharut Empire, was already a vassal state of the Sorcerer Kingdom and the theocracy was occupied with the elves. In other words, it was almost inevitable that the Holy Kingdom would have to formally request help from the Sorcerer Kingdom. And this in turn gave the Sorcerer Kingdom immense political legitimation. It was a taboo-breaking event that the Holy Kingdom, which considered all under to be impure, would actually ask the undead Sorcerer King himself for help. And it greatly enhanced the Sorcerer King's reputation when Eins granted his help to the living. And we saw in the later declaration of the war against the Kingdom of Riestais how many nations stood behind Eins and how much his political reputation had improved. But the whole situation had another facet. 
Just as Demiurge's invasion was designed to make Ein Sulgon look good in the eyes of the Holy Kingdom, then he intervenes on its very own behalf and drives back the demon emperor. So too would Ein Sulgon appear as a hero and a liberator in the eyes of its inhabitants, in the eyes of the many demi-humans and heteromorphs of the Abelian Hills, who had been freed from the yoke of the demon Emperor Yaldabaoth thanks to the undead overlord. Because just like in the forest of Top, in the Abelian Hills as well, all undesirable inhabitants and rebellious tribes, those who wouldn't bow their heads to Ein Sulgon, were eliminated without hesitation. But naturally, this action would damage the reputation of Ein Sulgon and his own sorcerer kingdom, if it became known that he was behind all of this. So this politically delicate task of subjugating and integrating a new territory, that is quite rebellious and fiercely independent, was instead left to Yaldabaoth. As a result, Yaldabaoth will be both hated and feared by the heteromorphic and demi-human tribes of the Abelian Hills and the Holy Kingdom. This in turn casts Ains, who later liberates the remaining tribes, in a much, much better light. From their perspective, from the perspective of the inhabitants of Abelian, Ains had freed them and invited them into his realm to better protect them, rather than simply brutalizing and enthralling them. This external political signal that not only humans but anyone regardless of their tribe or race can thrive in the Sorcerer Kingdom, as long as they adhere to the king's law, will become especially important when Ein Solgon tries to win over other nations where humans either don't exist at all or are just a minority there. For instance, the city-state alliance of Karnasus, the inhabitants of the Arklin council state, or other people in the rest of the continent, particularly the five inner realms that are vying for dominance in the center, might profit from this approach and this hope that the Sorcerer King will be ultimately peaceful. Because again, he saved the inhabitants of the Abelian Hills. In other words, the story of how the undead Sorcerer King defeated the Demon Emperor is crucial not only for the conquest, annexation and liberation of human kingdoms and of human states, but also for influencing other races. Moreover, this success of the Sorcerer Kingdom has another side effect from a geostrategic perspective. It weakens the status of the slain theocracy. It was Ein Sulgon's agent, Momon, who destroyed the members of Zurnon and saved Iran Tell. It was Ein Sulgon who saved the Dwarven Kingdom, a humanoid race with a high status within the Empire, at least from a legal perspective. As in, you couldn't just enthrall them. From the vicious Quagoa demi-humans. And it is still the Sorcerer Kingdom that stands by the Dragon Kingdom's side in its hour of need, supporting it with troops and supplies, so it can better defend itself against the beastmen invading its lands. And it was Ein Solgon, and before his enforcer and representative Momon, who fought against the demon Emperor Yaldabaoth and thus protected humanity. All of this makes the slain theocracy looks extremely negative and neglectful by comparison, and makes it glaringly obvious who is capable of acting diplomatically and who is merely dealing with their own problems, having neither the time nor the resources to help other countries. In other words, this image campaign is also a direct attack to the hegemony that the slain theocracy had built for itself. And again, this is very severe for the theocracy, the supposed protector of humanity in the new world. It was they who created the Adventure Guild 200 years ago, who for centuries fended off invasions after invasions, with great sacrifices to prevent the extinction of humanity. Their scriptures secretly fought against all non-human invaders to ensure that the defensive battle against the stronger, heteromorphic and demi-human enemies would not be lost, thus securing a future for humanity in this often cruel and merciless world. And now, thanks in large part to the actions of Ein Solgon, who eliminated the Sunlight Scripture and forced the theocracy to focus on the Elven Kingdom, 
because they were preparing for a potential war with the Sorcerer Kingdom and therefore needed to focus all efforts on one single front and couldn't just fight a two-front war against another enemy. Slain is no longer able to engage with and support other nations and people on their level that they had formally established because they simply lacked the troops. They couldn't just send out the Sunlight Scripture to help the Dragon Kingdom, which Draudion and Auriculus in the ninth volume also noted. But she didn't know why that Ayn Sulgon had just destroyed them. And the fact that they are now trying to recall former members of the Black Scripture from retirement to temporarily fill gaps in their ranks reveals the desperate situation of the nation. And they also try to rescue as many adventurers as possible from the fallen Kingdom of Rear's ties to assign them monster hunting tasks within Slain and its borders or just shortly outside of it, thus freeing up their own troops to pursue other goals. While the Sorcerer Kingdom manages to save entire nations, Slain by comparison has failed as a protector of the Dragon Kingdom and therefore it lost a great deal of international prestige and greatly diminished its value as an ally. In other words, by the end of Season 4 or Volume 14, the Sorcerer Kingdom has effectively replaced the Slain Theocracy as the protector and overlord of this part of the continent with which one should be on good terms, at all costs. And for all of these reasons, Demiurge attacked the Holy Kingdom. And with that said, now it's your turn. What's your opinion about the Holy Kingdom and Demiurge's attack on the nation? Let me know it down in the comment section. And while you're typing, I want to say thank you very much for watching, thanks to all of my Patreons for supporting this channel, and special thanks to... Dash 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 Other Daddy Other ASK Bad Guy Bad Burrito 316 Bezer Ben C Brandon D Chrissy Crowley 0221 Sia Crystal Prime Dead Slime Death is Mercy Deathless Dragonlord Demon Xenomorph 1987 Devin Downen Ding Dong Dan Pep Dragonlord Placido Saxophone, Duckwagon, Dunkler Krieger, Dystopia, Dystopia II, Enigmatic Unicorn, Feral Shivan, Guy with Dead Head, Hector Marino, Hoss, Huster, Jacob G, Jana B, Jason, J. Morris, Chromius, Kyle R, Lee K. Long, Legendarius, Lelouch V. Bitania with a mustache, Lexus Fox, Lord Nishiki and Rai, Lord Touch Me, Lofraiser, Merovec, Mr. Shoes, Mr. Tweaker, Michael R., Michael Y., Nope, Oh Hell No, Normal Toad, Oh Kill, Overlord General Gasper, Paddy Pantom, Personage, Ruru, Primus 11, Rhinomir, Kune Karakos P, Shergox's Daddy, Shadow Lightning Wolf, Shrine Keeper, Sir Axolotl, Super Tier Magic Batista Bomb, Supreme Cheese, Staris, Ted, Texas Deer, Diorg Warboss, Rock Ed Smasher, T. E. Vang, Vash Hawkeye, Vegito 27, Venture Fanatic, Wilhelm, Zinukai, and Sonagon. Thanks, guys. Anyway, have a nice day, and I hope to see you all again soon under my next video.